All right. Well, hello, everybody. It wouldn't be a webinar without some minor technical difficulties, which uh, had us uh, delayed for about five minutes, but we promised some superb content. Um, I'm going to be chairing this session together with uh, Barbara, who I'm going, to, I'm going to ask Barbara to introduce herself in a second, but I'm Jonathan Lindner. I'm a cardiologist. I hold the Francis Myers Ball Professorship, and I'm the uh, Vice Chair of Research at uh, University of Virginia. Uh, this is a webinar that is really focused on uh, really two things, which is number one, the complexity of patients who, who come to us these days with a suspected prosthetic uh, uh, device infections, but also the, the timing of this kind of coincides with about a year ago, the, the uh, publication of a, oh, it's a, it was a multi-authored, multi-societal sponsored uh, document, almost an expert consensus uh, document, an expert opinion that was published in Jack Cardiovascular Imaging, uh, highlighting the use of uh, multimodality imaging, uh, which gives us a lot of opportunities to, to uh, uh, image and assess and uh, fine tune our uh, assessment and, and uh, treatment of these patients. And that's what this uh, this webinar is all about. Uh, I'd like uh, to hand it over to Barbara, who's going to introduce herself and, and tell you a little bit about the structure of the program. Barbara? Hi, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, welcome, everyone. Glad to see everyone, uh, all the people who could join today. And sorry for the delay. My name is Barbara Srichai. I am a cardiologist at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital, and I serve as the Vice Chief of Cardiology here. I'm also a multimodality imaging um, person, and um, it gives me great pleasure to co-host this with Jonathan. Today we have great uh, talks for you. We're going to start with updates on uh, anatomic assessments, and then followed by molecular imaging of inflammation, and then some interesting cases that are going to be presented by our um, presenters, which will See here on the screen, we'll introduce them as we come along, um, to just kind of highlight each of these different aspects of imaging and different types of uh, prosthetic devices. Um, <clears throat> we'll have a short panel discussion after each of the cases, so please enter your questions into the chat and we'll try and address them. If we don't get to them during the discussions, then we'll address them um, ad hoc afterwards. Uh, we'll start with our first presenter. Um, Dr. Alfonso Waller, he's the Director of Cardiac Imaging and Associate Professor of Medicine and Radiology at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School. He's a multimodality cardiovascular imager and he's board certified and reads ECHO, CT, Cardiac MR, as well as Nuclear Cardiology. He is a member of the ACC's Cardiovascular Imaging Council and his clinical and research interests includes optimal selection between imaging tests. He's going to be giving us a lecture today, an update on the anatomic assessment uh, with ECHO and CT. Take it away. Thank you. Can you hear me? Perfect. So thank you for that introduction. I have uh, no relevant uh, financial disclosures, but today's talk, this is not a debate about which modality is better. Um, these imaging techniques really are complementary. And ECHO is a first-line imaging test in suspected endocarditis. So the hashtag ECHO first is very appropriate for this talk. Um, with regards to, if we look at the 2020 valvular heart disease guidelines, the very first thing with a patient at risk or with suspected native valve endocarditis or prosthetic valve endocarditis is blood cultures, assessing modified Duke criteria, and involving the heart valve team, and then getting an ECHO. The heart valve team, obviously the patient is at the center, and there might be consultants, which are cardiologists or infectious disease uh, specialists. The cardiac imager plays a crucial role in this, especially in the evaluation, as we'll see through today's talk. Um, interventional cardiologist, which could be an inter a true interventionalist, or it could be an electrophysiologist, and a CT surgeon all make up the, the heart valve team. If we look at the modified Duke criteria, um, you can make a definite in um, diagnosis by pathologic criteria, but we're going to focus on the clinical criteria, which includes two major or one major and three minor. Within the major criteria, echocardiographic evidence of infective endocarditis could include an, uh, a mobile mass. So as in the image on the right side of the screen, we see a transesophageal echocardiogram with a valvular vegetation on the tricuspid valve um, or new valvular regurgitation could be uh, a major criteria. For possible infective endocarditis, it could be one major or one minor or three minor. Within the minor criteria, 
um, there's mention of vascular phenomenon or uh, major arterial emboli, and those might be seen in other, other forms of imaging, such as CT. So echo really is, is the, the first line in terms of imaging. The advantage of echo is that it's widely available, it's portable and affordable. In terms of actual resolution, echo has great spatial resolution, great temporal resolution. Cardiac CT has great uh, spatial resolution, doesn't have as great as temporal resolution as echo, and obviously it will depend whether you're using a single source or dual source scanner. Uh, cardiac PET, which we'll hear about soon, is uh, you know has great contrast resolution. The advantage of echo is we can assess the size of valvular vegetations. So here's uh, a bioprosthetic valve. Um, and the tricuspid position that has mobile uh, echo densities consistent with valvular vegetation. We can look using 3D, we could assess relationships to other cardiac structures. And it's also very portable and could be used in procedures. So this is a, an angiovac procedure uh, at our institution where um, intraprocedural intra echo helped guide in terms of removing this val valvular vegetation from the tricuspid valve prosthesis. So it can be used in procedures, and these, this is the, the actual um, vegetation that was removed from this patient. We could as assess size of leaks or abscesses, um, and we can also assess direction of flow and function, which is an advantage of echo. One of the greatest disadvantages of echo, unlike tomographic imaging, is that it is operator dependent. It's limited by the views that were obtained. So this is a transesophageal echocardiogram um, in a patient with a, with a self-expanding TAVR valve. And if someone just looked at the proximal aspect of the valve, they would say that the valve looks okay. Um, but as the ascending aorta was assessed, or higher up uh, the distal aspect of the valve, there was a mobile, uh, mobile echo density attached to the actual uh, leaflets of the valve, and this patient was found to have endocarditis. Other disadvantages of echo um, is acoustic shadowing. So depending on where you're imaging from, you may get acoustic shadowing. This is an example of a parasternal long axis with a, in a patient who actually has an, um, a loop recorder. So there was acoustic shadowing from the actual loop device, which would obviously impact the uh, interpretation of what's going on in the left ventricle, even with the aid of contrast, that those segments would not be visible. So unfortunately, a lot of metal can, can impact um, uh, assessing cardiac structure. This is a, a more relevant case in terms of someone with a mechanical mitral valve, and we're seeing the exact acoustic shadowing that can occur from a mechanical valve. We can look in other views, and in ad additional views, um, you, in a parasternal long, you may be able to see that there's a, a mobile echo density in this patient um, concerning for endocarditis. Cardiac CT. So when echo images are not adequate or um, there's suspected perivalvular abscess, cardiac CT can be uh, useful. The advantage of cardiac CT is that you're getting tomographic uh, information. So this was a patient who, at an outside hospital, had an ASD closure device placed, and he had a CT for other indications. So in scanning through this patient's CT, what was found was that his implanted device, instead of being in the heart, was in the um, descending thoracic aorta. A volume-rendered CT image can be shown you know, to help in terms of the interventionist or other members of the heart valve team to decide what to do about this case. The other advantage of cardiac CT, valves or devices can be evaluated throughout the cardiac cycle. So this is a patient with two mechanical valves, a single tilting disc in the mitral position and a bileaflet mechanical valve in the ear position. And this, these valves are, are, are working normally in this patient. But we can also identify malfunctioning valves. So this is a patient with a mechanical valve where obviously one of the leaflets appears to be immobile, and there's thrombus associated with that immobility. The advantage of cardiac CT, echo images may be limited. So in this 
parasteral long, or sorry, this apical three chamber view, it looks like there's an echo free space next to a bioprosthetic valve. The it's not clear whether or not this echo free space is coming from the LBOT or if it's coming from uh, the aorta. Even on TE, it's it's not exactly clear. Um, these where exactly was the entry site for this? But with cardiac CT and using a 3D workstation, it was identified that it was arising from the LVOT just below the, the mechanical valve. And we could see throughout the cardiac cycle, in systole, it's expanding and it has a narrow neck consistent with the pseudoaneurysm. So because we have tomographic information throughout the cardiac cycle, we could replay the images in any plane that we'd like. This same patient also ended up having uh, a perivabular leak around, around the actual valve. And with this, we could also assess, obviously, the coronary arteries. 3D volume rendered images can be used to help in terms of the heart valve team to visualize and, and, and plan pre-surgical or uh, interventions. The disadvantage of CT or the disadvantages of CT, it does require or it's helpful if you have a cooperative patient that's able to follow breathing instructions, the patient has a regular rhythm. We do use intravenous contrast and there's radiation exposure and there is limited functional assessment. So while we can see overall function of the heart or if the valves are opening, we're not assessing for regurgitation um, and such. So it's more anatomical imaging. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Alfonso. Superb uh, talk. Uh, again, to everybody who is uh, uh, attending this uh, this webinar, we're not actually taking Q&A after the first two lectures, but feel free to put in your, uh, I've seen a growing list of people, participants, feel free to, to put in your questions by chat, and we'll try to uh, get to them at some time during the program. Also, we're going to guarantee that all, and all, all chat-based questions will be answered within 24 hours and sent to participants of this uh, uh, this webinar. So thanks, Alfonso. Uh, next up is uh, Vaskin Vosizian. So Vaskin needs very little introduction to most of you. So Vaskin's uh, been at the University of Maryland for just about ever. He is not only a past president of the uh, Society for Nuclear Medicine uh, and Molecular Imaging, but is uh, really a pioneer of, of, of nuclear imaging. Some would even say a demigod. Um, so the, uh, the other role he's got, he's currently the vice chair of the board of scientific counselors uh, of the uh, NIH uh, Clinical Center. Uh, he's going to be talking about the uh, about molecular imaging of inflammation. And just an aside, in that that expert um, uh, document that was published, there's about six authors on that expert document. So I was on that that document, but Vaskin was really the driving factor for and and force behind getting that uh, that uh, 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 manuscript and statement together. So Vaskin, Jonathan, thanks uh, for that very kind introduction. It's a, a pleasure to be with you. Um, I'm going to be spending about ten minutes. Uh, giving an overview of where the molecular imaging uh, fits in. Um, if I could have the next slide, Barbara. Uh, I have uh, just uh, one consultation. Uh, objectives, obviously, we want to understand the role of FDG PET-CT for diagnosing cardiac uh, implantable electronic devices, LVADs, uh, and uh, learn about how to differentiate between infection and inflammation and discuss the significance of FDG PET uh, CT imaging in guiding clinical management. Next slide, please. So uh, again, for cardiac device infections, obviously, uh, you look for local signs, systemic symptoms, blood culture, TTE or TE, CT, or radio labeled WBC scintigraphy. Uh, next. Uh, the question is, what is the role of PET CT? And unfortunately, most of the studies uh, on publications have been case reports, observational studies, that are mostly confirmatory and or incremental to the current diagnostic approach. Next slide, please. So here's an example from our laboratory where a patient was referred to us for possible uh, pacemaker pocket infection. And uh, you see three rows of images. Uh, the first one is non-attenuation corrected, then CT, and the last row is the attenuation corrected images. And we look at the pocket itself uh, on CT, you know where the, you see where the pacemaker is. Right above it, you see very focal, heterogeneous, hot uptake of FTG. Uh, such uh, uh, is uh, consistent with infection. If it was a homogeneous uptake that surrounds the pocket, 
that's most likely inflammation and not infection. Uh, next slide, please. So here's an example of a patient. On the right-hand side is non-attenuation corrected image with the arrow where you have a photopenic area where the pacemaker pocket is. On the left-hand side is with attenuation corrected image. Now, again, a, a warning is that if you look at images in attenuation corrected, which is what we always do when we're reading oncology or cardiac viability studies, when you have a pacemaker, uh, you get a hardening artifact that may appear that there's an FEG uptake there. Albeit it's smooth and it's, it's not intense, but you could potentially read this as abnormal. So it's very, very important that you look at the image in non-attenuation corrected images where you can see that there's nothing there. All you see is a photopenic area of the pacemaker, and therefore this is not infection. Next slide, please. Uh, the first study was by Sarazen and co-workers back in 2012, where they wanted to determine whether FDG PET CT has incremental value to uh, cases that were unclear by echocardiography or modified Duke criteria, blood tests, etc. So as you can see there, of the 42 subjects, 10 of them had negative FDG PET CT. So in this case, clearly, it's not an infection related to the pocket, and so you look for another cause. Uh, of the superficial infection. In the case of FDG positive PET CT, uh, 32 of them were positive. We can see that eight of them were limited to the skin. So this is cellulitis, and all you need to do is antibiotic therapy. Among the 24 subjects, the, the, the lead infection was either lead, pocket, or intravascular infection, which requires complete system extraction. So you can see that by simply doing FDG PET CT, you can differentiate negative from cellulitis from a more serious pocket infection that will require complete system extraction. Next slide, please. So I'm going to show you some examples now. Again, you see the uh, fused image of CT and PET in the lower part. You can see where the, uh, uh, the device is, a cardiac device. And again, where the arrow is pointing out, it's photopenic, not attenuation corrected. Therefore, this is a completely negative study, not cellulitis, and no infection at all. Next slide. Here is an example of a patient where you have mild uptake where the pocket is. Uh, and again, uh, this was done about four to eight weeks after the device was implanted. You can often see this. You can, you can identify that this is inflammation and not infection. Uh, and so you can dismiss this. Next slide, please. Now, here's a patient where you can see that there's a very ugly-looking, hot, irregular-appearing heterogeneous uptake that's in the pocket below the device, uh, and clearly this is infection. Uh, nothing else will mimic this. Uh, you, can, you can now use this uh, as a way of uh, collecting your sample to sending it for, uh, for culture, uh, but this is positive uh, for a pocket deep pocket infection. Next slide, please. Uh, now, uh, there were a couple of studies that have looked at the uh, accuracy of CID, and they did a meta-analysis. And you can see that, again, uh, if you put all the data together, the sensitivity and specificity are very high in the 90% range. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. So what is the value of FDG PET CT? Uh, you, you, you heard uh, an elegant discussion of uh, a presentation with echo being always the first line imaging, and I agree completely with that. Now, here's a patient where you can see that there is uh, infected lead, which could, which could have been identified by echo. The question is, echo will not be able to identify the septic embolus. By FDG PET-CT, you can see that there is clear septic embolus uh, beyond the lead infection. Next slide, please. Here's another example where you can see the lead infection with the red arrow. With the open red arrow, you can see that there is extensive uh, septic emboli in the lungs. So uh, obviously, patient management treatment options will be completely different uh, if you know that there's septic emboli there or not. Next slide, please. Now, what about prostatic valve endocarditis? Uh, again, uh, modified Duke criteria is used. Next slide, please. The question is, what is the incremental value of FDG PET CT? Next slide. Uh, and again, uh, a study by Sabian coworkers uh, shows that. Uh, just click one more time, please, Barbara. Uh, you can see that the 
uh, do criteria definite and final uh, uh, diagnosis was 70%. Next, uh, uh, next, next click. But with FTG PET CT, you increase the sensitivity from 70 to 97%. Next click, please. Without sacrificing specificity. This is very, very important. So we moved from 70 to 97%, but the, but the specificity was still in the 50% range. Uh, next slide, please. Now, here's a, a very nice patient example of where the relevance of FTG PET CT can be. In the yellow arrow, you can see very hot area where the prosthetic valve is, and clearly this is the site of the infection. Again, you could have made this diagnosis perhaps with echo or perhaps with CT. But the advantage of PET is that when you look at the entire body, you see in the abdomen, in the left lower quadrant, intense uptake with the green arrow which tells you that this patient has adenocarcinoma of the colon. And by the way, that is the nidus of the infection for the valve. So if you don't make that diagnosis, obviously uh, it doesn't help you to replace the valve because it's going to uh, have recurrent infection. So again, the beauty of FTG PET-CT is that not only you can identify the primary perhaps source of the infection, but also the embolic sources of, as a consequence of the infection and that has become a very, very important incremental value to anatomical imaging. Next slide, please. Again, uh, uh, this is a study uh, where they compared WBC imaging with PET imaging. If you could click on this, you could see that the sensitivity of PET is very high. But if you're worried that whether this in, in, inflammation versus infection question comes up with the valve, if you're not sure, you can always do WBC imaging well, even though the sensitivity of WBC is low, you can improve the specificity of the FTG PET signal. Next slide, please. What about LVADs? We were the first uh, in the country uh, to uh, have referral of patients for LVAD patients because of our experience uh, previously with the pacemakers and, and the prosthetic valves. Next slide. So we looked at our, uh, uh, next slide, please. We looked at 35 patients who were referred to us. Uh, with 24 clinical suspicion for infection, 11 had just baseline post alvad implantation. Uh, we had both ischemic and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. We had uh, HeartMate 2, HeartMate, Heartware, and Jarvik patients. And we followed these patients over the next 23 months. 40, 14 patients died, and we looked at the data carefully. Next slide, please. And what we showed was that, again, uh, that there were uh, examples of peripheral infection, as shown here a very hot uh, area, but limited to the exit driveline infection. Next slide, please. In this, uh, we have the driveline infection, but no central infection. Next slide, please. Here now you see the cannula exterior more and, uh, or central infection. And, and last slide, now you can also see the pump involvement. So we look at the patient population where you have central cannula or pump infection versus simply limited to the uh, exit wound site, where, as you know, it's much easier to treat that infection. And we followed these patients over the, last, uh, over the next two years. Next slide, please. And what we've shown here in the Kaplan-Meier survival curve that if you had no infection shown in green, all of them survived. Uh, the one in red, where you have central infection, you can see how uh, the probability of survival was significantly worse compared to those with peripheral uh, only limited infection shown in blue. Uh, next slide. And so, uh, as Jonathan said, we had expert panel uh, statements, uh, including ECHO, CT, and nuclear folks, put this nice schematic diagram, which was published in JAK Imaging. And uh, again, uh, as you can see, uh, on all three criteria, whether it's valve, uh, pacemaker, or LVAD, you start with TTE or TE. But you can always uh, immediately re realize that in case of, for example, with the valve infection on the right-hand side, even if you have the definite prosthetic valve in the carotid uh, diagnosis, you may consider FTG PET-CT if you're worried about septic emboli or you want to know where the nidus of the infection is. In the middle category where you have equivocal information, again, you can use FTG PET-CT to make it definitive. And if you still have a question of infl infection versus inflammation, you can always order WBC scan. But thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to the discussions with the cases. Thank you.
uh, Dr. Um, <laughs> just the end, sorry, just double <laughs> playing double duty here. But we're going to move on to the first of our um, three exciting cases. Um, gives me great pleasure to, to um, invite Brian Willemess. <laughs> Hopefully, I said that right. Um, yep. He's an advanced card, advanced imaging fellow at the Brigham and William, Women's Hospital, and he's going to present a case of complex prosthetic valve abscess. Great. Thank you so much. I hope everybody can see my screen. Um, so we're going to talk about a complex prosthetic valve abscess case that we had at the Brigham over the winter. Um, so jumping right in, this is a 66-year-old male. He had a history of a childhood uh, mantle radiation to his entire chest that was complicated by a calcific aortic and mitral stenosis. He had a mechanical aortic valve replacement and a root enlargement done in 2018. And then he had a six sinus syndrome with a dual chamber pacemaker. He presented to his outpatient primary care with about 10 days of flu-like symptoms and anorexia weight loss. He had a white count of 16 and elevated LFTs. So his uh, PCP ordered him for a CT chest abdomen pelvis, which showed splenic infarcts, which you can see here. And he was admitted to the hospital for workup of presumed endocarditis, just because he had the history of the aortic valve and his blood cultures ended up growing strep bovis. Uh, so jumping right into the imaging, this is his transthoracic echo, which I think is most remarkable for just how technically difficult these images are. It's really hard to actually see the aortic valve prosthesis, and you can see there's a ton of mitral calcifications. On closer view though here, you can see there's maybe something that's kind of mobile here. So we moved on next to a transesophageal echo, uh, which is most remarkable for the significant number of vegetations that you can see here in the a left atrium up above. In fact, we counted four at one point, which you can see all along here in this two-chamber view. Um, looking at the aortic valve, there's a well-seated mechanical aortic valve. It does look like there's a small mobile echo density on one of the leaflets. And when we explain through that, you can also see that there's kind of a small mobile echo density here. When you looked at the aortic root, uh, it looked like it was a little bit enlarged, and sometimes, and on x plane and on kind of further investigation, it did look a little bit big, um, which was concerning for a valve abscess. However, when we were doing this, we were kind of, uh, because of this uh, root enlargement technique where they put a graft that, they say cut the non-coronary cuff and put a graft in that includes part of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve before they seat the mechanical valve, we weren't entirely convinced that what we were seeing was truly abscess or if it was um, merely post-surgical changes. And then finally, with this pacemaker, you can see that there's mobile echo densities within the right atrium. And so in summary, uh, this was a 66-year-old guy who had a mechanical aortic valve uh, vegetation, vegetations of his mitral valve annulus, at least four in his left atrium, and on his pacemaker lead. But then the question remained, what about this aortic root abscess? So then from there, we turned to multimodality imaging, and again, uh, just to show you the power of a cardiac CT, we can take the CT and cut it in any different direction, and we can um, maneuver the data in basically any way we would possibly like. What we saw here was that when we looked at the aortic valve, which you can see opening here, there's this area of thickening that's kind of right underneath where the left main comes off in between the aortic valve and the mitral valve. Um, we decided at that point to go a step further and add FDG PET imaging, which we can fuse with the cardiac CT, and so this is lighting up inflammation. You can see clearly that this area that was thickening next to the aortic valve is lighting up. And so this is consistent with the prosthetic valve abscess. Um, we can do some fancy 3D uh, manipulations to kind of, again, see that the aortic valve is opening nicely, but there is a FDG uptake around the outside. When we compare with TEE, this is basically the same view. So the left atrium is up here and the ventricles down here. We can see that this area of concern that we had is in fact lighting up directly on PET, which confirmed that what we are actually seeing here was abscess. When we looked in the left atrium, we could see that the mitral valve the annulus was involved, as well as there's another mobile vegetation up here, which has lightly uh, active on FDG. So these also confirmed that these were all abscesses. Um, so just to summarize, again, he had a mechanical aortic valve complicated by an aortic root abscess. He had mitral valve annular uh, abscess, or not abscesses, but endocarditis. He had at least four vegetations in his left atrium. And then while his pacemaker lead wasn't lighting up on FTG PET imaging, uh, it was explanted. So his clinical course, he underwent pacemaker explant, which was complicated briefly by uh, a conversion pause and some brief CPR. A week later, he underwent a very complex aortic valve replacement, mitral valve replacement, and extensive debridement and reconstruction. This is part of the pathology of the mitral valve, which you can see. This is an H&E stain where you can see all of this fibrinous material. 
And this is a gram stain showing that it's very gram positive um, with these gram positive cocci, again, confirming that this was endocarditis. Unfortunately, due to the severity of his other issues, he had a prolonged three month hospital course that had multiple complications. I think we've all been in a similar situation. And unfortunately, he did end up uh, succumbing to septic shock. Um, and that is my case. And I will stop sharing. Thank you, Brian. So there, there are some questions that came up in the chat, uh, not so, not yet about this case, but actually from uh, Baskin's talk, but that some of these questions actually do apply to this case. So uh, two of the questions are about uh, temporal course of uh, pet FTG activity. So, um, you know, what uh, somebody asked, and, and Baskin, maybe you can, you can uh, talk about this related to this case, which is, um, uh, you know, how, how soon after surgery do you essentially get rid of the, the nonspecific post-surgical uh, inflammatory signal? In this case, I think it was pretty clear, you know, one of the key things that you look at at PET, PET CT is the non-homogeneity, right? Yeah. And not exactly. just the non, not just the non-homogeneity, right. but you actually yeah. put it together. There's no way in hell that that, that aortic, um, um, uh, right. peri-aortic thickening was from the, the reconstructive surgery. That was, yeah. that, that looked well, like an abscess, but, but can Jonathan, you, can you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question, Jonathan. And, and just so that you know, the European guidelines, uh, have recommended not to do FTG PET CT until four to six weeks after, uh, device, uh, implantation. Now, uh, that's nice, and I think that from the perspective of, you know, if you follow these patients, sure, the inflammation FTG will be less so in four to six weeks. However, from clinical patient management perspective, oftentimes we can't wait four to six weeks. If someone is having uh, a septic uh, uh, emboli and you're worried about uh, that these, this is, a, you know, valve is infected even though it was within the four to six weeks, uh, it, it makes sense to me to go ahead and do go ahead and do the FTG PET CT. And as you said, Jonathan, look at the distribution pattern: homogeneous versus heterogeneous, ugly-looking, you know, abscess. Uh, and with CT, with PET CT, again, uh, as was discussed, you can look at the anatomical co-localization of FTG, and even that will help you to make the diagnosis firmer. And if it's still is there a question, as I said in, in my in my in my talk. You still, yes, you know, we, I get a lot of times where the ID guys and the surgeons always disagree. ID thinks it's infection, surgeon says it's inflammation. You can go ahead and do WBC imaging, to, which, which, which has a higher specificity, uh, and, and then you can put all this uh, information together. There may be a lot of studies, but these are complicated cases, and I think that doing the right studies to get the entire information together uh, would be worthwhile. Uh, another question that came up in the chat, and again relates to use of PET CT. Um, obviously, in this case that uh, that Brian just showed us, the patient went to surgery. I mean, there was just extensive infection. But if this was a patient with a prosthetic valve that was going to undergo antibiotic therapy, um, is there a role for uh, doing a repeat PET CT as follow up? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's. I, I'm actually blown away with it. That's a fantastic question. So. You know, when we look at images, we always say sensitivity specificity. What, what people haven't actually reported, and there are some studies in this, say if you have an FDG PET negative after antibiotic treatment, do you still have to kind of be aggressive? And the answer is no. If you follow those patients, the FDG signal has prognostic implications of saying, yeah, you may not have, maybe, maybe if you stop the antibiotics, it will recur, but at that point in time, uh, if the FTG signal is better, it is definitely prognostically better. You don't have to be aggressive about it. Yeah, it, it, it actually goes back to a biologic question as well, which is inflammation resolution. So, so in, in, you know, for people who study immunology, do you know what resolves inflammation? Inflammation. So <laughs> there, no, seriously. So there, you know, they, there is there is essentially the classical and then the reparative immune responses. And you actually need a very prolonged reparative immune response to essentially resolve the, the, the deleterious inflammation that's associated with an abscess. So people who have done kind of repetitive PET, PETS uh, FTG studies have actually shown like pers really persistent, you know, evidence of, of inflammation going on. It does not necessarily mean that that is, is uh, uh, infection. It can be sterile inflammation, right? Yeah, absolutely. And just the other thing that comes up, just so I'll just put, throw this in, uh, there's this confusing literature about quantifying the infection versus inflammation by using SUV. Uh, I am not a fan of it because we've seen a lot of infections, like 
uh, inflammations that can have a kind of over overwhelming number of, uh, of SUV value. So a lot of it should be visual and not don't rely on some threshold of SUV that says, yes, it's an infection. No, it's not an infection. Uh, I, I would use it as an adjunct, but I wouldn't rely on it. Can we move on to the next case? I just want to make sure everybody has a chance to. Yeah, there was there was a a, a quick there was a, a chat question that came in. I'm not sure if you see if anybody sees it or wants to address it, which is differentiation of inflammation, infection, and actually hypersensitivity to the device. Uh, I, I again, I I think that there's going to be cases that's going to be difficult for FTG to differentiate infection from inflammation. We grant you that that's when we would go to WBC imaging. Yep. Uh, so I just want to, I just want to, don't forget WBC is your friend if you're having confusion between infection and inflammation. So we're going to go on to the next case, but while we do, I'm going to ask somebody in our panel to actually maybe comment on the role of newer pet probes uh, and nuclear probes like dotatate or some of the, the cytokine receptor imaging if they actually have a promise of actually producing more specificity. So anybody wants to attack, attack that one, go right ahead. Um, my pleasure to introduce the next uh, uh, case presenter and speaker, which is uh, Paul Kramer. So uh, Paul is a, uh, a well-known cardiovascular imager and cardiologist at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, he has the enviable or maybe not so enviable uh, positions as the Associate Director of Cardiovascular Training Program as well as the uh, cardiovascular uh, ICU at the, uh, the clinic. So uh, Paul is going to be talking about an LVAD dilemma. Excellent. Thank you, Jonathan. And it's great to be part of this webinar. It's really been a a fantastic uh, discussion so far. I think we can all appreciate the complexity of these patients and their, um, you know, highly comorbid illness. Um, in, in reference to the, the most recent question in the chat, I, I don't know if, it, if it's exactly what they're getting at, but the one thing I would just comment as an aside is if you've had patients who've ever had surgery with bioglue, um, we often see that uh, as being FDG avid. Uh, as sort of uh, an inflammatory response that may not, uh, it's not technically an allergic reaction, but certainly that's something that you'll see in your clinical practice. And so it's always important to be aware of what was actually the surgery, what was the material used uh, uh, as, as part of that. So I have an, an LVAD uh, dilemma um, as my case. This is a 33-year-old woman. Um, she had a history of a peripartum cardiomyopathy her, her medical uh, history is complicated by HIT. She had a primary prevention uh, ICD. And four years prior to her current presentation, she had a HeartMate 3 LVAD, uh, initially as a bridge to transplant. Uh, at that time, she had mitral and tricuspid valve repair uh, with aneoplasty rings. So initially, postoperatively, she had a fairly rocky course uh, with polymicrobial infections. Um, but convalesced uh, and then did well for the next several years. Uh, she then presented with uh, discharge from her driveline, and unfortunately blood cultures uh, growing multi-drug resistant uh, pseudomonas. Um, and as part of her presentation, she was in acute kidney injury. So I think it's been emphasized in the earlier talks, we, we start with, with echocardiography. So here's a representative transesophageal echo, uh, mid-esophageal view at 90 degrees, and you can see this mitral valve ring here. Uh, there's really just mild mitral regurgitation. Uh, and here on the long axis view, you can see the, the mitral valve ring, the anterior mitral valve leaflet. There are, are no uh, apparent independently mobile echo densities associated with the mitral or the uh, aortic valves. Uh, and here's a 3D uh, multiplanar uh, reconstruction of the mitral valve as well. So I think when you're doing these transesophageal echoes, it's important to really interrogate uh, assiduously all of the foreign material. Um, so here's a representative bicable view where we're looking at her, her cardiac device lead, which looked okay on echo, uh, as well as a central uh, venous catheter. Uh, so of course, this patient has, has an LVAD. Uh, so this is the uh, inflow cannula in the LV, and you can see uh, here that the flow looks fairly laminar, and there are no independently mobile echo densities associated with that. 
And this is often difficult to visualize as the, is the uh, cannula in the ascending aorta. Um, but here, uh, such as you do see it, um, there's no evidence of endocarditis involving that cannula either. Um, and looking a little bit uh, more superiorly, we can see part of the um, outflow cannula anterior to the ascending aorta, and at least what we see of it uh, looks okay. Um, so these, these are complex patients with LVADs, as, as Vaskin uh, touched upon, and, and really uh, require multimodality imaging as, as part of their investigation. Uh, because of the acute kidney injury, she had a, a non-con uh, CT scan. And, you know, you don't see any fluid around the drive line. There's no evidence of abscess. Um, there's no gross uh, abnormality uh, on this chest CT. And the abdominal CT was really only notable for this soft tissue thickening uh, around the drive line entry point, uh, which, we, which we knew clinically as well. Um, so the next test we then pursued was a whole body PET CT. Uh, and I think what you can see on this whole body imaging is that there is increased signal involving the entry point, involving the subcutaneous drive line path around the pump itself and uh, part of the outflow tract. And I think as Baskin highlighted that the advantage of the whole body PET is really to kind of characterize what's the extent of the peripheral uh, versus or in addition to central infection. And here's some of the PET CT uh, fused images where you can see the increased FDG signal around the pump, this HeartMate 3 pump here. Uh, the increased FDG signal around the uh, outflow cannula uh, here. Uh, and the increased signal uh, around the uh, entry point. Uh, so as was noted, I mean, we do use uh, SUVs as adjunctive uh, information and sort of report what the background uh, liver and blood pool signal is uh, relative uh, to the areas of abnormality. Um, so here the background blood pool, uh, excuse me, liver SUV is 2.5, around this drive line is around 6.1, uh, um, and around the outflow cannula has a maximum SUV of, of 9, and around the pump is around 4, with a background blood pool signal around 1.7. So I think Putting this all together with the uh, Pseudomonas uh, bacteremia and this uh, extensive evidence of central infection involving the LVAD, uh, she went uh, explant of the LVAD as well as removal of the ICD. Even though we didn't see any evidence of, of infection there, we would routinely uh, remove the ICD in a patient going for cardiac surgery such as this. And what did, what did, what did the surgeons find? So there was purulence around the driveline inside the chest. Um, and the culture uh, grew uh, pseudomonas. And this uh, patient is, is now doing well as an outpatient. So I think uh, this is uh, a paper from Germany, similar to what Vaskin showed from his own work, is to really characterize the extent of the infection, whether it's at the driveline entry port, the subcutaneous driveline path pump pocket, or the outflow cannula uh, itself. So in terms of the, the key takeaways uh, from this case, I think it really does highlight the use of, of multimodality imaging uh, to really uh, interrogate any possible source of prosthetic or endovascular infection, prosthetic valve rings, cardiac device leads, the various components of the LVAD system. And uh, I think a key uh, takeaway here is the role of FDG PET to identify peripheral versus deep infection. So I'll stop there. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Um, what we welcome questions in the chat. Um, I just had a question. Um, you know, you obviously PET CT was very important in this um, in di in this diagnosis, particularly with the peripheral drive line, which is not very well seen on um, ultrasound imaging. Um, but with regards to PET CTs or with regards to FDG, is there a dietary prep that you guys use um, since these are cardiac scans? Right. Yeah, it's a good, it's a very good question, a very practical question. Um, so I think it is important to prepare these patients the same way you do in your institution for your cardiac sarcoid preparations. So there is, I think everyone has a little nuances in terms of how they want to do that, but the, the, the underlying premise is just suppression of normal myocardial glucose utilization. So at our center, we do that with a ketone-based formula for the day before the test. Um, and we do give uh, intravenous heparin uh, as well. 
Uh, but I think the, the no carbohydrate uh, diet before the test will really help um, the, the yield of this assessment. So, Paul, I've got a quick question about the, the signal that actually comes from um, not the drive line or the, the, the pump, but actually the, the um, uh, inflow or outflow you know, portions of the, the pump. Um, you know, people who study thromboinflammation, so, you know, if you lay down platelets on a surface, they are way more sticky to leukocytes than activated endothelium. So, so since, you know, no, no LVAD is absolutely perfect, have studies been done kind of showing you know, the activity of PET-FDG early on versus uh, over time in LVAD related to pa patients who may actually have kind of some uh, mild degree of platelet adhesion within their devices? Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. Um, I think most of the, the data here remain quite limited in, in the sense that it's single center retrospective cohort studies where patients are referred. I think it'd be very interesting, and I'm not aware that this has been done, but to do something where you sort of just routine imaging to establish baseline. I mean, it's, it's evolving to be kind of a similar story to what we touched upon in, in prosthetic valve endocarditis, where um, I think early on probably there was a lot of low signal homogeneous intensity that was called positive when it was really just normal variant. Um, so, so I think there probably needs to be more investigations along those lines. Yeah, Jonathan, I agree with you, right? I mean, it would look it would look very much like a train track, very mild, homogeneous versus heterogeneous, right? Lumpy, bumpy. I mean, it, 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 infections are very ugly looking. I think that anytime you have a very smooth looking things that along uh, graphs, for example, even if you just do regular graphs, you, you're going to see that, as you point out, uh, uh, Jonathan. So I, it's really that it's, it's not that confusing if you read a lot of these. Yeah. I know in this patient you could not, um, the patient has renal failure, so you didn't give contrast for CT, but if you were able to do a contrast-enhanced CT, um, do you think that would have substituted for the uh, FDG, or do you think you would have still had to do the FDG? Uh, potentially substitute. I, I think, as was touched upon, a strength of, of whole body PET is, is delineating the extent of, of systemic emboli. It's, endocarditis is a metastatic disease. So I will say when we do CTs, we sometimes pick that up and the PET, you know, in a specific case may not have additive value. So we certainly don't do, do PET in, in all the patients. And what we typically do is, is a 4D retrospectively CT-gated CT of the entire heart. And then we do sort of a delayed phase of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. And that delayed phase is often quite helpful in delineating uh, abscesses uh, or, or, or uh, you know, embolic phenomenon. So I think yeah. we probably have to move on because of time. There is a question about anticoagulation strategy, if you can answer that one uh, on the chat, Paul. So. If, if the patient's receiving anticoagulation, we do not give intravenous heparin. Yep. Okay, great. Um, we're going to move on to our last presenter. This uh, gives me great pleasure to introduce Cyrus uh, Haddadi. He's an electrophysiologist, actually, um, but he does do some cardiac imaging, including um, intracardiac imaging. He is at uh, my institution, MedStar Washington Hospital Center, where he serves as the Associate Director of Cardiac Arrhythmia Research. He's also one of two lead extraction specialists for our practice, and he has experience, as I mentioned, both in lead management as well as imaging. Uh, take it away. Oh, sorry. He's going to be giving us um, a case of imaging for detection and management of lead infection. Thank you very much. Let's share my screen. So I, uh, I really am humbled and thrilled to be with you all today. Let's see. You might want to switch out of presenter mode. Yeah. Yes, perfect. Okay. So uh, as we know, infective endocarditis carries an exceptionally high mortality and morbidity when untreated or undertreated. And so uh, at MedStar, a combined multidisciplinary approach is key. And I'm very grateful to my cardiac imagers because otherwise, as a plain, simple country electrophysiologist, I don't always know what I'm looking at. Um, now, you know, other presenters have talked about the role of ECHO, CT, FDG, PET, their advantages, their drawbacks. And in my world of right-sided device leads, pacemakers, and defibrillators, because it's a low-flow right-sided environment, there's often thrombus on the leads as well. So it can be challenging to correctly apply the modified Duke criteria 
And sometimes the answer is actually totally obvious, but as we'll see in this case, you still get it wrong. So I'd like to talk to you about a 67-year-old lady with a history of complex congenital heart disease that was repaired about 20 years ago, sick sinus syndrome, with a dual chamber pacemaker in place, and a relatively recent generator exchange. So she had had a dental procedure followed by a few weeks of exertional shortness of breath, fatigue, and subjective uh, fever and chills. So already the pretest probability here is very alarming. And I think people have touched on the role of echo first. And I think it's important to point out that uh, AHA and ACC guidelines allow you to go straight to TEE in uh, suspected infective endocarditis with device leads, given the better sensitivity and specificity there. And so that is what we did. And I hope you can appreciate that this is not subtle. And I'll play that again. You have a, a very positive arrow sign here pointing to very extensive echo-dense material on the RV aspect of the device lead. Here's a slightly different view. But again, just thick echo-dense material there. And again, the challenge is going to be, is this thrombus infection or infected thrombus? You can also see that there are independent uh, echo densities here on the atrial lead as well. And really here, it's again, it's not subtle. It's very striking, this massive collection that you can see very clearly in the RV. There's also some turbulent flow through the tricuspid, suggesting that this uh, massive vegetation, not surprisingly, is causing a degree of functional tricuspid stenosis. And a 3D view. So um, our imagers helped me out, and this is their read. A large amount of echodense material adherent to the RV, some of which extends from the distal RA through the tricuspid valve. And then there are serpiginous portions with independent hypermobility and prolapsing across the valve. So again, this could represent vegetation and or thrombus and appears to cause functional tricuspid stenosis. And we have some impact on the uh, leaflets themselves. So I will always get cardiac CT on any patient with possible infected leads, uh, not only to evaluate the course of the leads through the vasculature, but to take a look at the leads inside the uh, cardiac chambers themselves. So if you follow these leads out, and I'll play this again, you really can see that there is, once again, extensive echo-dense material surrounding the entire body of the right ventricular lead. And there is an intimate relationship here uh, with the tricuspid valve apparatus. And um, once again, very grateful to our cardiac imagers who uh, we work you know, hand in hand with on the heart valve team who identified additional lesions in the RA as uh, suggested by TE imaging. So once again, demonstration of a large hypodensity attached to the RV pacemaker lead and additional hypodensities in the right atrium. And so the clinical course of this patient, we obtained blood cultures, which grew out a coagulase negative staph in one out of two bottles. And interestingly, we did not extract. Instead, we sent the patient to um, Angiovac, which I did with my cardiac surgeon, to debulk vegetations. I think the consensus decision was that this simply represented massive thrombus. And in hindsight, you know, maybe that decision doesn't make sense, but I think it's important to point out that there has been a lot of recent literature, including this publication in Jack recently, demonstrating that only about one in eight patients who are appropriate for transvenous lead removal um, and extraction actually undergo the procedure. And you can see a massive delta in mortality between patients who undergo uh, extraction and those who do not. So the patient was treated as if she had massive thrombus and not infection. And 
two months later underwent routine TTE. And unfortunately, once again, you can see here in the uh, right ventricular outflow view, massive, massive vegetation intimately uh, involved with the device lead. Here you have a nice sex plane. And once again, demonstration of extremely turbulent flow. Our, uh, our imagers presented this lead to us. And, uh, and so again, it is not clear whether this is thrombus or vegetation, which is the eternal challenge with right-sided structures, although the preponderance of the evidence probably would have suggested infection. She came back a few weeks later with recurrent cough, shortness of breath, chest pain, and chills. Blood cultures were again positive. Now this time, we decided to take her uh, to extraction, as I advocated. And our repeat CT lead extraction protocol had some high-risk features. She had pulmonary emboli, and she had dense adherence between her innominate and the sternum. And so, therefore, plans for an open repair by the surgeon were canceled, and I took her to lead extraction. She had a successful lead extraction. Um, the device was entirely removed. And once again, we used Angiovac as a supplementary therapy to attempt to debulk the leads and remove as much of uh, what I suspect to be massively infected thrombus as possible to ensure a good outcome. And she is doing well and thriving. So uh, to conclude, uh, you know, once again, as all of my other very astute presenters have pointed out, there are multiple synergistic roles between ECHO, CT, and FDG PET. Um, and again, all of us share one goal, which is the good outcome and thriving of our patients. So thank you very much for this opportunity. And I have reached the end of my presentation, so we will stop sharing our screen. Thank you, Cyrus. So, so uh, because we started a little bit late because of, of technical difficulties, we'll we'll stay open here for a couple more uh, uh, minutes for our questions. I, I, you know, we haven't talked much about echo, but I, I will say one thing, which is uh, both the presentation that Paul showed as well as yours, Cyrus. You know, it's really important when you're doing TEE to essentially be knowledgeable about sometimes some atypical um, imaging planes and approaches when you've got patients, for example. Uh, you know, Paul showed a beautiful example of how you can get way up on the SVC and even over to the brachiocephalic vein on some people who have indwelling devices. For RV leads, really going to a transgastric view, going to about 110 degrees and turning over to the RV for a beautiful long axis of the RV can really be helpful for looking at not just the location, but really the spatial extent of lesions, which help sometimes differentiate vegetation from thrombus. I completely agree. The bicable view is probably my favorite because as an extractor, I'm always terrified about injuring the SVC, right? So if I can demonstrate that there is space between the lead and the SVC wall, or if I can use a snare to force peel a lead off the SVC wall, I feel reassured that my extraction will risk stratify into a slightly lower risk than uh, if the lead is very, very adherent. I was going to ask if there's any, because sometimes we see in the SVC that it just seems like there's, whether it be thrombus or infection, but thrombus I'm thinking about, where it looks like it's adherent to the back wall. And um, what, and I'm sure like that helps in some sense when you're, as, as you're planning your extraction. Absolutely. So I always get a cardiac CT to try to assess adherence. But if there's any doubt when I'm in the EP suite, I'll put up a snare or um, if you saw in the picture that I had, I'll actually take a deflectible sheath and I'll candy cane it around a lead to try to see how mobile and how maneuverable the lead itself is. And 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 it's probably also important to real to, to for everybody to kind of remember is is look at your other clues that are available to you, not just on clinical you know presentation, but on imaging. In a patient like this. If you know, if you don't have severe TR, the RV function isn't bad. They're not in a low output state. There isn't spontaneous echo. There's not a lot of stuff to kind of leaning towards this patient having that extensive degree of, of thrombus on the, on the lead. Can always happen, but uh, but always have kind of situational awareness that uh, you know the more flow stasis and larger chambers and and less flow energy there is, the more likely you are to uh, to essentially develop thrombus on things. Whereas this person, you know, 
the, the, one, the one bad thing about webinars, guys, is it makes everybody believe that Echo has a frame rate of about three frames per second. So. Oh. <laughs> in terms of their repeat, their repeat rate, but but just uh, just be aware of, of of those things as well. I don't see any um, additional questions in the chat, and we're five minutes over now. But I think that's great because we started late. <laughs> yeah. So Barbara, why don't you why don't you uh, give you uh, give some uh, uh, some so up, uh, comments? Yeah, so I want to thank everybody who joined the webinar and our presenters for giving us an overview on anatomic assessment as well as um, imaging for infection and inflammation, um, and then our nice, nice examples, um, case presentations. Um, thanks, everyone, for their insightful questions and the answers. And um, I think, Jonathan, unless you can have the last word. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, I want to thank everybody as well. And I, I tell you one thing, which is, you know, the complexity of these cases, are, you know, the, these are not extraordinary cases, right? These are kind of the everyday things that we see. And it just goes to show you how complex device infections really are on average in a lot of our patients and, and you know, some of the clinical decision making that becomes very difficult. And, you know, the, 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 the more multimodality approaches that you essentially can take to things and, and have, you know, more tools that you have in your toolkit, the better off you are. So uh, thank you, everybody, for really uh, uh, you know, producing some absolutely great uh, content. And I do want to steer everybody to the, the, the great document uh, that, uh, that uh, Baskin helped uh, uh, lead to get published about a year ago. Yeah, I, I have to think of one thing or kind of like to synthesize everything, as, as you were saying, was, is just that the multimodality aspect. It's not only for diagnosis, but I think in, in treatment planning. And I think that's the important part as well. All right. Take care, everybody, and thanks for joining us this evening. Bye. Bye.